become a little bit obvious in a moment when we look at what we're actually demonstrating because it's a little bit hard to transport. Um, this talk is about flip dots and managing a flip dot display with a Raspberry Pi. So kind of before we go any further, what we'll do is take a look at the thing that's kind of behind me. Um, it is a flip dot display for scale. There's a Raspberry Pi 4 in a box. So it's quite big. It's also extremely heavy because each one of these dots is electromechanical. It's um, it's not LEDs. So it weighs quite a lot. It's difficult to bring to London and sort of navigate the tube and, and so on. So it's staying up here in, in Nottingham. We're doing this remotely. Um, what does it do? Let's see if we can make it do something. It um, basically does anything you want. Um, they are usually or were used in digital signage. They make this lovely noise when they change. And the other thing that they've got uh, going for them is I've just stopped that script now that was running is when they're not changing, they don't really consume any power. So there's no lighting here. These are sort of uh, very bright on one side and black on the other, and it's all done with electromagnets. So before we sort of play around with this some more, we need to go look at um, what are these things and where do they come from? So basically to do this we need to sort of talk about buses a little bit um because this thing behind me came out of a bus in around the year 2000 it was fitted in a bus that bus was scrapped um i'm not entirely sure when but a couple of years ago and uh it was parted out and i was able to buy this this sign but the purpose of these things is they're generally destination blinds in buses uh so they tell you where the bus is going to go or um what the next stop is or whatever. And they were popular for a while because a couple of properties we'll look at um, in a minute. But historically, these things were literally blinds. They were just bits of fabric with the destinations written on and the driver would wind a handle and, and round would come the, um, you know, the next destination. Um, there's a few buses in this presentation. They're all Nottingham-based ones, which is like where I grew up. That particular one is the one that used to take me to school. And what you'll see now is you still don't see flip dot displays. Uh, what you see now is LED matrices or matrices, um, which are essentially like the sorts of things you can buy in maker kits. They have LEDs. They're usually a single color in vehicles. Again, they have this sort of high visibility property. Uh, they're silent and they do require constant power, um, but very low power these days. So modern buses have these. And then somewhere in between, we had some like a period where things were just a bit cooler. And we have what was called a split flap display. So you might have seen these in, I think I've seen them in Waterloo Station some time ago. They're, they're long gone now. Frankfurt Airport still has them. They're those displays where when something changes, it makes this amazing clacking sound and the letters all spin around and then it settles down to the new state. Um, these are like really cool. You can make them, you can buy them from certain maker companies, but they're really expensive because each uh, letter has got the whole alphabet in there and then all the numbers and then some punctuation, anything else you want to play on screen. So those were kind of fun and expensive. And they also had this property of like no power consumption when they're not changing. And then so in between that and the LEDs, there were these flip dot things that had their day. Um, this was the hardest picture to source for this whole presentation was like, can I find a picture of the bus flip dot display in a bus? And the answer is generally no, because they seem to have had a moment and then stopped. Um, so you might also have seen them in use as like railway clocks or something like that. But this is a bus in New York. It's using a flip disc display or a flip dot display. It's got a backlight. Uh, this one here has also got a backlight. It's just uh, you don't really need it unless it's very dark outside because the, the dots themselves are so bright. So like happened to my bus, a lot of these um, got retired and broken up. And 
they're having a second life in the maker community for a couple of reasons. One, because they have this really satisfying mechanical property of they make noise when they change. Um, so you don't need to like announce that something's about to change. You just change it and it makes this sort of noise as the um, the sign updates, as I guess we saw and we'll, we'll see some more. And the other thing is the company that made them put out a relatively decent amount of information about them and did it in PDF files. So people have reverse engineered how to operate these, how to wire them up. Um, they're fairly simple. It takes 24 hour 24 volt power, 24 volt power, uh, like in a vehicle. And that's about it. And then the data protocol we'll actually look at in a minute. So flip dot signs, having a bit of a second life. In the big scheme of things, not that expensive because they're mostly scrapped from buses. There are places that you can buy new old stock ones that you know were never fitted to a bus in the first place. They're just very old and they've sat on a shelf. So how does it work? You can watch this sort of video loop at a moment. It's been slowed down quite a lot. What happens is each dot in the sign or the matrix here has a very, very bright side and a very, very dark side. And then they're sort of on a, a hinge or a pole at the top. And there's a couple of electromagnets, a solenoid in each one. And what you do is you tell it basically turn on, turn off, and it changes the magnets around and causes the dot to flip, which is why you have this um, actual physical noise. It is actually turning and banging into the other side when it finishes. And that's also why it's sort of object permanent, if you like. You can turn it off and it will stay uh, where it was. You turn it upside down, ship it to somebody else in the um, UPS, whatever. It's still going to be in the same state it used to be. So that's how it works. And this is sort of a blow up that. I made of, of what they look like. So each one's just this two colored thing um, and it sort of sits on a rod. And then behind there, there's a couple of electromagnets. But there's lots and lots of them. So this particular sign I've got is probably the medium sized sign. It's the one that would go down the side of the bus, not on the front or the back. And these signs generally work in, in threes. So there's a front one, which is really big, a side one, which is that big. And a rear one that might just display a root number. Um, and we'll look at how the protocol works with if you have multiple of these. But basically, it comes out as a giant bit array. So it presents to the, the programmer as a giant bit array. Um, I've got 7 by 87. So that's sort of like 0 to 6 and then 0 to 86 across the, the way. Um, it has no concept of text or fonts or anything really it's just on or off so anything you want to draw on there you have to like figure out a bit like uh mark was saying about early a lot of us grew up with like early zx spectrums you used to have graph paper from wh smiths that was like you know eight by eight and you draw your little sprites on it for your game or whatever you were making very much that sort of bitmap array approach um so how do we control the thing? You know, we've got this sign, it's originally from a bus. It's not designed for use with um, any sort of programming language, really. So what happens if you were to put one in the bus originally, would you, you would buy that little unit on the right, which is um, a controller unit for it. And you would plug a laptop into the serial port on there and there'd be proprietary software and you could load a load of destinations and this uh, control here just gives you the ability to flip through them and press send it. And it would send it out to the front, the side, and the back. And yeah, that would give the bus driver pre-programmed sets of destinations, which is probably what you want. Because again, going back to Mark's example of like, we all walked into Curry's or WH Smith's or Woolworth's or wherever and did 10 print something rude, 20 go to 10. You don't want to give the driver a free text input to put any old thing he wants on the uh, the front of the bus and then go driving it around on his last day at work. You know, that would not be good for anybody. So the actual controller was quite limited in what it could do. And then there was proprietary laptop programming. Um, people who are better than me at electronics looked at this and started looking at how the controller talks to the sign. And similar to parts of Mark's project, it uses RS-485. So 
it uses a pretty simple way of connecting A to B. And this means we can connect it to quite a lot of computers because you can get a USB to RS-485 modem thing for about three, four pounds on the usual places, Amazon, eBay, wherever. And you can then treat that in your code as a sort of uh, USB modem and send it whatever protocol the thing at the other end is expecting. And then the thing at the other end will, will react to that. So in this case, the bus protocol or well, the bus sign protocol for controlling one of these is really quite strange. So imagine if we had seven uh, dots vertically aligned. So the first column in the sign behind me, and we wanted to turn on the first, the third, the fifth, sixth, uh, you know, the last four. You could look at them like this. So we could say, oh yeah, okay, this one here represents the top left one. The zero means turn off the one below it and so on. And the way this works is we have a header that we send out on the protocol. It's like, hey, this is for a bus line. And then we send an address. And that's because there's potentially three of these in a vehicle. They're all wired together. They all have different addresses. So like one, two, three, um, however you choose to set them up with a switch on the back of the sign. And the sign will then only listen for messages for that address. Then we need to encode every single column. So in my case, I have 87 of them. And we do it like this, which is a little bit weird, but luckily other people got there first. Um, so what we do is we treat this as a binary number. So like the first one is worth one and the zero is two and the one is worth four and so on. And we should um, then get a column of numbers yeah, with the sort of more significant numbers as we go up, add them all together and we get a total. So we get 245 is sort of the decimal representation of this um, this column here. And then where this protocol is really strange is what it does is it requires us to turn that into a hex number, which you would kind of think is maybe the end of it. So we've got 0x f5, so hex f5. But what the protocol actually wants is the ASCII codes for each of those hex digits. So for some reason, it wants OX46 and OX35. So to encode that column of things to send to the sign, you need to do the math to do all of this, and you come out with 4635. So you would send 4635, next column, get all of those together, and then calculate a CLC or cyclic redundancy check code to make sure that um, the other side can determine that it's got all of the data and it wasn't corrupt, essentially. And then you send all of that data down the uh, USB RS485 pretend modem thing, and the sign updates. And what is uh, important to note here is it's a broadcast, so you just like TV or PubSub, if you're familiar with publish subscribe protocols, you just put, put it out there on the RS-485 and the sign either updates or it doesn't. If it wasn't listening because it's the wrong address, it's not going to update. If it's corrupt, it's not going to update. It's not going to tell you when it's finished it's updating. So you kind of have to time these things a bit because it takes a finite amount of time for the sign to update. There's only so many frames you can you can send in a second. Um, so you've essentially got sort of one frame per second or one frame per communication broadcast TV type thing going on here. Luckily, most people won't need to worry about this because people went ahead and wrote drivers for these signs, uh, which make them a lot more accessible to people to just get on with doing projects. So I've mostly worked with the Node.js driver in the top right. It's probably the most mature one for these. Um, it supports fonts, so you can send it text, and the driver actually works out all of the ASCII font stuff that you need to represent letters. It's what we were using in the demo just there. It also supports scrolling, so if you send it a message that's bigger than your display, it will scroll it for you. Um, and it has a debug mode where you can actually see what's going on with the protocol underneath, which is handy if you wanted to do something maybe a bit faster or uh, trickier. But Again, what you have to do when you're working with these is every time you update it, you essentially update every one of the flip dots, even if it's not changing. So there isn't like a delta mechanism. You can't say, oh, okay, I know I turned them all on. Now we're going to start turning some of these off and we'll get a pattern. You have to send it. Um, it literally is like making a flip book 
you know, you have to send it the whole frame, the whole frame, the whole frame. You can't send it the deltas. Then there's a Python interface, and that works more in the sense of the thing is a big uh, array buffer. So you just send that a big array of on, off, off, on, on, off, and it encodes it and sends it to the sign. So if you wanted to work with fonts, et cetera, you're going to have to like figure out the encoding of those fonts yourself and you're back to ZX Spectrum days with the uh, with the graph paper and um, figuring out what your sprite looks like. So those are the main two drivers that are out there. You can, of course, write your own because we know what the protocol is. So at some point, I might want to try this with the um, little Pi Pico W and see if we can do it in MicroPython. But for now, these two work great. Then what's this got to do with Raspberry Pi? Well, anything and nothing really, because we are plugging a USB RS-485 into there. So the main advantages of having a Raspberry Pi here are it's got a USB port, but so does most things. I could plug this into my Macintosh. Um, but it can also be mounted in the back of the sign. So I've got a Pi 3 stuck in the back of the sign there with some stick-on Velcro from B&Q. Uh, that's the RS-485 down there, the thing with the green um, uh, screw blocks and a couple of wires. And then the expanded view there is my address selector. So I've got bus address one selected in this example. So when we address this sign, we'd know it as sign number one. And if we had multiple of them chained together, like in a real bus, we could send messages to each of them, or we could send the same message to all of them at the same time. How does it work code-wise? Uh, there's two, two ways of coding this, uh, using the drivers provided. I mean, you could use anything else as well, but the easy ways with the drivers. So this is the uh, Node.js example. Um, it's It doesn't necessarily lend itself particularly well to Node.js because it's asynchronous and it's non-blocking. And this is pretty much the opposite of that. What we need to do is, um, form up the message that we want to send to the sign. And we do that with, it's just a write text function in the driver here. It handles encoding the font into the protocol and all of that for us. And then what we do is send it to the sign. But sending it to the sign is a broadcast. There's no, there's no way that I know that the sign has done the thing. Um, I can register inside this, this node program, I can register for a, oh, the driver has finished sending the data on the wire, but I've no idea if the sign has actually finished updating yet. So there's a lot of sort of playing the sleep game in this, which is not very uh, node centric, which is why you see a lot of uh, a lot of promises in there that involve sleeping for a bit and setting a timeout. So if we want to display a long message on this sign as multiple words, we have to like write something, sleep, write something, sleep. We're not going to get told, oh yeah, okay, I'm done with that. You can you can do the next one. Then in Python, interface is slightly different. They took a different approach. Um, and what we see here is again, it, it presents as a serial modem. Um, and in this case, we tell it how big the sign is. So I've got six by, uh, zoom's kind of in the way there. Uh, sorry, address six, eight and four by seven configured. I'm a little bit short on that. My sign's bigger than that. And then what we do is we create an image inside the driver, which is just a big array of bytes. And basically we plot into it as if it was a bitmap. So yeah, I've got 083 and 06 being um, set to randoms here. If they were set to one, it would be, um, sorry, these are randomly picking up a, a position between 83 and six, so a random one. And then we just set it to true or false for on or off. So it's a much lower level driver. Um, not as great for text, but really good for writing games or something like that. If you want to do something else with, with one of these, which we'll also take a look at. So what's a practical application of one of these displays? Um, really, there isn't one. It's kind of just for fun. Um, so I took something that I would have been doing anyway, and which also involves a lot of other Raspberry Pi stuff. 
and I started doing uh, aircraft tracking with the display here. So let's go here. And this is a very complicated diagram. Uh, so basically, as part of my day-to-day -day job, I do developer advocacy for a database company. So I get to build projects with databases and Raspberry Pis. I started looking at ADSB receivers, which are um, a bit of hardware that you can buy that plugs into a computer and it receives messages from aircraft going past and what we could do with that information. So I started putting it into an in, into a database and then looking up from the basic information you get about the aircraft, which is its call sign and its height and its latitude, longitude, uh, looking up in flight aware, well, okay, where's the aircraft coming from? Where's it going to? What sort of aircraft is it and who owns it? Um, so I built a whole project with that. And the sign for this is a front end. And this is where having the mechanics is really, really useful because if nothing's going on out there in sort of East Midlands Airport land or things that pass over us here in Nottingham, then it's quiet. But when something happens, the sign just by virtue of updating makes quite a racket and you can, um, you can hear it going and just look around. Um, so I have it in this project, which is like a whole other thing that's quite a lengthy talk or a set of live streams that are on my website if you want to see how that works. And it's a front end in there. So what I can do is show that working. Let's... Uh, the other fun thing here, I'll just bring this up is... I'm literally SSH into this is called bus sign .local on my network and there's pi in there. So I'm like SSH into the bus sign and I can run stuff on it. Um, so if we do, there's a front end for this. And this is kind of depending on live flight traffic out and about that my aerial can see. But hopefully at some point, the uh, the sign will have an update and what has happened when that occurs oh here it goes so let's do this that's a Ryanair flight from Dublin to somewhere on a um on I guess 737 that's gone past and what it'll do is if we get any new information from that plane like it changes altitude it'll update and display it on the sign here it goes again double into Luton this time so we've picked up another one 737 800 there's the registration there's the altitude and so on and I had it repeat a couple of times so that if the first time the sound catches your attention and you miss something you can just watch it and this is kind of how these things work in, in public displays. You know, you might have seen them on platforms in railway stations being a clock where you can just hear when it ticks over the minute or doing train information. So we picked up another plane. So Manchester to Heathrow on a BAA 320. So this is an example of using it with real-time stuff. Um, there are other components to this system that aren't in the back of the sign, but they all could be. They could all run on that one Pi. Um, I've actually got a component that's listening to the radio and putting things into the database running somewhere else in the room, but it doesn't have to be. So let's see, is it off again? Yep. BA flight again to Manchester. So it's off doing that. And if we stop it, again, it's, we tap and stop it in this state. I could have stopped it in a state where it had got some other bit of information on, and that would be frozen there now because the sign doesn't basically do anything when it's not being driven. So that's um, sort of an example of using it for a real project. The other sort of thing that we can use it for is just fun so i'm currently working on essentially flappy bird but very slow for it so at the minute as you can see there's no moving of the bird but the collision detection is there when the bird hits the bar there everything stops 
and the scoring stops. And in terms of how fast can you make one of these things go, it's a function of how many uh, flip dots you've got to update because it updates from the left side to the right, which is where you see things sort of janking across the screen there, um, and they're slightly out of sync. So the wider your sign is, the slower the update. This one, I can reliably drive it from Python at about two updates per second. So the game can't really get any faster than this. It would start skipping frames if we did that. So we can build games and all sorts out of these. This also shows it. it was later in the day, so the backlight's on in this case. Um, you don't control the backlight through uh, software. There's just a button on the top that I put in there because it would have been connected to the vehicle's uh, headlight circuit. So that's how that works. Then other people have been doing stuff with these as well. They seem to be having a bit of a renaissance. So the Pimeroni folks saw this one on my live stream and they bought one. Um, somebody else in Telford saw this one and they bought one and replicated the whole plane tracking project and they're doing other things with it and you might have seen this guy he's called sam battle he's known as look mum no computer he kind of does um synthesizer stuff and he also does electronics projects and he built one of these for like a maker's giveaway thing at christmas and if i whoops come back to let's play the video there's a way of playing videos in here, but it doesn't want to play. Oh, here it goes. I'm just going to pull this across a bit. He built something that approximately... Oh, yes, it is now done. I really don't want to send it now because I really quite like it. Especially in this box, it looks really quite fetching. That's sped up a little bit, but with these smaller versions, you can do faster updates because there's just less stuff going down the bus and takes less time to ripple it across the screen. Well, it works. It's a little bit clunky. I need to send this within the... You get the idea. There's no reason why we can't do something like more interesting with the pie in the back here because everything to do with the sign connects to that single USB port. So all of my GPIOs are still free. So I could put like a arcade button on there or a joystick or something or a trackball and drive it and build, I don't know, really, whatever you can think of that fits into the, the size. And the other thing that I wanted to show quickly was um, these things have been out and about there. Couldn't quite find the right picture, but Italian Family Fortunes used a flip dot display for years, apparently. British one did for a little while. So they definitely were a thing for a while. Um, the company that makes them is called Hanover Displays. They're still around, but they make other things now. You know, the, you're not going to get a new one of these. But if you are interested and you do want to get a hold of one, then the usual place is probably eBay, uh, like with anything else, stuff crops up on eBay from time to time. Um, I know from experience, that if you buy a large component of a bus on eBay, then eBay will continue to try and sell you the rest of the bus. So my like eBay suggestions are now like double decker buses with all our MOTs, that sort of thing. Um, mine did come from eBay. It came from a bus scrapyard that assured me it was working. Um, there was one on there last week when I looked that was out in Wales somewhere. There's also this company, PSV Automobilia. I don't know anything about them other than a couple of people have bought signs from them and said they've been great. Um, they have like new old stock ones. So if you want different sizes of sign, uh, you don't you know, want just whatever lands on eBay, then they've got all of them and they do packages of them. Uh, how much do they cost? Uh, that one cost me, I think it was £112 shipped, and they are heavy, so it's like Parcel Force or UPS or something like that. Um, one from PSV will cost a little bit more because it's likely to be a bit cleaner and have a sort of guaranteed power source. And then what else do you need to make it work? Well, I'm using a laptop power supply that puts out 20 volts. It turns out that's pretty adequate. Um, I'm using 20 volts, 5 amps, because 20 volts, 1 amp 
either power the backlight or the flip discs. So you get it working, then you turn the backlight on and it would stop and it just ran out of juice. Uh, but it can take up to 24 volts, which is possibly an easier solution to, to find or power off of whatever you can get out of scrap electronics. So not, not terrible. Um, then the other thing that is kind of cool that's like these and maybe the future, so there's some electric buses in the back there, is something called a mechanical seven segment display. So you might have seen seven segment displays in you know, old calculators, or it's a popular maker project. They're pretty cheap to buy like four digit ones and you plug them into a load of GPIO that you can control each segment. What this is, is imagine that combined with the flip dot. So each of these seven segments is itself a tiny little mechanical thing that makes that really nice noise when it moves. But instead of having like on off in one pixel, you can have any combination of the seven segments on or off times the size of the board. These are also like brand new manufactured these days things. So the speed on them is significantly higher. There are people out there doing really nice projects with things like the time of flight sensor that Mark mentioned, where you put your hand in front of it and it basically draws the outline of your hand in one of these displays and as you move around, it you know, makes a really satisfying um, sound. So those, I have no idea how much they are, but they're um, not something that, that I have access to, but I just wanted to put them in there. And that was really, in order to get everybody down the, uh, the pub on time and meet Tesco's on time, that was really the end of the talk. So, if you want to see more about this, there's some resources up there. I have the whole project that does the plane spotting. Um, and then there's just some other stuff on my website using this display and, and similar concepts in the seven segments. So thanks, everybody. I don't know if we have any questions. I've got the chat up. I don't think we do. But, um, the room? Anyone have a question in the room? After one question. Challenge rather than a question. It's a challenge rather than a question. So you've taken me back, Simon. Thank you very much. So when I was at university in between each year, I was working at Siemens Plessy on a system called NMCS2. As boring as it sounds, National Motorway Communication System. And they were using mm -hmm. flip dot signs. So the challenge is, if you can find someone who works at Siemens Plessy who's been there a while, you could get one, possibly, which is the size of a motorway sign because they were using these and I saw code which actually exercised these things in the middle of the night to make sure that they were still working. So thanks for taking me yeah, back. I think, I think if you look around in the U S they have those still and they're on trailers and they drag them out to roadworks. And there's like a hacking scene for like intercepting those things, plugging something into them and leaving, you know, probably not the original roadworks message on them overnight until someone one notices, but, uh, Great, thanks. We're gonna to have to end it there. Sorry. <clears throat> thanks a lot, Simon. That's really great. No That's problem. really cool. Thanks very much.